I want to ask anybody up front, was this, like when you first saw the title, what was it like to be at bat? Was the reading different than when you thought the title was going to be? Anybody? I didn't really think about it too much in depth before you started reading. But usually when I talk about this, at least initially, people think it's some silly philosophical thing where a person is going to try to imagine themselves in the back and then try to get some philosophical waxing as, hey, now I'm back, how does the world look? You know, and, uh, usually when people start reading this, they're like, hey, this is something different, right? Um, but this, this comes from his paper in 19, I don't know, 60s or such, uh, early 70s. You know, and it's really about, like, the mind conscious, uh, you know, consciousness with the mind-body problem, I should say. But anybody have any, like, impressions on it to begin with? Like, what did you think? I know it's Friday. I know it dropped 50 degrees last night. Okay, let's get started. Now... The whole thing about this is, per se, is we're never going to quite get past that mind-body problem. How do the two interact? And, you know, Nagel's coming out from a little different angle. So this is just, again, one more, I want to say, approach to it to hopefully, you know, help us understand a little bit uh, deeper. But what his, what his issue is, and don't get, like, tied in with the words I have up there, but... There's this thing called reductionism. Now, there's different understandings of it. Nothing's so monolithic that, you know, one person's view of reductionism would solve everybody else's definition of it. But it's the idea that, you know, everything can really be boiled down to the sum of its parts and such, right? So, like, for instance, uh, it's just a matter of understanding the process and everything. So, for a computer... You know, we could totally understand a computer and we could pull it apart. There's no mental state to that, right? I mean, that's part of the issue with, you know, artificial intelligence that a computer's not going to have consciousness. So we know that basically, you know, as the sum of its parts, that entire system, the enclosed system, you know, you know, it speaks to the issue as to what the thing is. Um, same thing with, like, water, right? We can H2O. There's, no, there's nothing else there. You know, so if we had that same type of reductionist view of the human person, in other words, if we were just a sum of all our neurological impulses and everything else, then we really wouldn't have a mind-body problem. What it really means is, like, the mental state is not some separate thing, all right? So whatever we're searching for, it's not there. There is no mental state. We're just a sum of our parts, and the whole thing's interacting. Maybe we don't quite know how it happens, but that's all there is. That would sort of solve the mind-body problem because you haven't really said the mind is anything other than what the um, aspects of the body are, all right? So this would be like a, a real material reductionism. Um, he's, now the problem, like, the problem is something to this degree. Even if we were to ascribe to something like that, you know, then what is the self and who are we and how do we know anything else? Let me, let me work up to that. He says, the minute that you could say something is like, all right, or you can tr start to understand like, what it must be like to be that, then that thing must have some level of consciousness, right? Like, we don't wonder what it's like to be water. We, we might talk about the properties of water, but we don't sit here and wonder that because we don't ascribe consciousness to water. Um, we might say something about what is it like to be a robot. <laughs> well, I really did lock it down. I think I locked it. Sorry. No. I, we had to shut it really hard because it wouldn't stay shut. There's no lock on that, though. Hey, Okay, so, you know, we don't sit there and wonder about you know, does water have consciousness? I mean, maybe somebody does, but that would be quite imaginative. We also don't do the same with computers. We figure whatever the, you know, the function of the computer is, that's the sum of it. So it has no particular mental state. So all I'm trying to make with that point is that if that was our type of reductionism that we were going to use on the human person, we wouldn't have a mind body problem because there is no mind per se. The body just does what the body does. 
We may not entirely understand all the aspects of that, but we really wouldn't have to go any farther than to know that. Once we know that, um, we're pretty much good. Um, let's see. You know, well, but we know, even other human people, we know that there must be something to be like that human person. Uh, we could probably envision that too with fish. You know, we don't know if fish have consciousness, but we can almost imagine what it's like to be a fish. We can imagine what it's like to be a chimpanzee or such. So, you know, we don't, what he's trying to say is that this is where the mind body problem is going to come in. Because now we're trying to figure out how these things work. In other words, think of Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory and how he talks about many things in life. It's almost robotic, right? So if we were to have this type of reductionist view of the human person, like if you, I don't know, maybe you went home and your sister had had a new baby and you went over to visit it and you're like, oh, it was so cute. The baby was sitting there and my sister, she's such a good mom. She was down there and she was playing with the baby and oh, it was, it was so beautiful. Okay, now a person who, who was a, like a biological reductionist would not say something like that. And they would say, oh, look, that woman, you know, has, you know, um, oxytocin receptors that are reacting to the young child that is stimulating something. You know, in other words, there has to be something there that it's just a biological function that's happening. Um, we would almost take away any individual of consciousness for the human person. And if you, like, if we were having a debate on personhood, right, and trying to determine exactly when does um, a human, what constitutes, um, let's say, human personhood, like, we, we don't really argue about human beings, even unborn. They're human beings. What else? It's not a draft. But we might argue about whether or not they're persons, and as some people will ascribe, well, it's, you know, self-consciousness, when the child becomes aware. Well, it's probably not until, like, you know, four or five months post-uterine, right? So even ethicists, like uh, Peter Singer from Princeton, he's an advocate for infanticide. Not that he knows it's illegal here. But he says up until five or six months of age, we don't have a person. All we have is like a biological being, okay? Um, now, that may sound horrific to some people, but he's, that's very uh, consistent, all right? I mean, if he's, he says, look, I say personhood begins with consciousness. And part of it's this, because you could, you know, you could almost envision, you know, like, what, like the, the person is like at least aware of their own existence. To what degree, we don't know. Now, there are some people, and I think the book even said it's extreme, that would think only humans and only humans above six months old and such have any level of consciousness and all things other have none, that'd be a little hard. I mean, we like to think that, you know, at least some of the higher animals have a sense of themselves. And we kind of get that, even if we don't quite understand it, right? So the whole point here is that this idea of reductionism is something that, you know, is going to be overcome a little bit here. But in reality... As long as you can almost envision, you know, what it must be to be like that thing, on some level, you're ascribing consciousness. Now, we got to forget that we can have quite the imagination, so perhaps we can envision what it's like to be a rock. I went, you know, okay, I'm an artist, right, so my bachelor's degree was in art, and we didn't have money for models, so we used to take turns just going up on the, and posing with a, um, just like a, like, a, like a cloth, almost like we call it like a... It was just a, it was a sheet, really. It was just to create shadows and everything. And we had this one guy in our class who was a little on the odd side. And he goes up on the little, you know, raised platform, and he literally gets into a ball and puts the, the cover over him. And everybody's, like, looking at him, thinking, what in God's... Finally, the professor said, what are you supposed to be? He said, I'm a rock. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, we could joke about something like that, right? But nobody's going to envision themselves a rock. You know, maybe in some yoga pose or something, you're going to try to come up with this. But we don't ascribe being to that, that type of element, okay? That, that's the thing. Um, so, the problem is, is that, you know, when we're going to try to talk about an experience that we've had, experiences can be quite personal. And they're typically difficult to share. Um, sometimes they could be shared, but we're not even quite sure if that shared experience is still the same thing, right? Like, sometimes, like, a song will just sort of, like, you know, bring something back. 
So as you guys get older, some of the songs that you listen to in junior high and high school, as, the, as you get farther away from them, there'll be a certain level of memory and nostalgia that gets stimulated by those. And perhaps, you know, if we go back and think of Hume the other day, perhaps if you share the, um, you know, the recollection and, and the proximity, it's even stronger that you might remember the same things from that experience. But we're never quite sure on that, right? So have you ever heard of the term phenomenology before? That's something you'll win some money in Scrabble with that word. Um, in other words, Nagel's going to try to say perhaps there's some element of the subjective experience that is still objective. That sounds a little odd, right? Like, but there's something in your and my experience. So what phenomenology is not really per se like a separate type of philosophy. Many times they just say it's nothing but a method, all right? It's an approach. Um, but it's, it's very experiential. And it's kind of like came about... Mm, uh, at least to its strength in the early part of the 20th century. So, like, if we had the window shade open and we were looking at the building across the street, our senses are going to see what, what it sees, right? Like, if there was rain be you know, between us and the building, that would become part of our experience. If it was, you know, a little bit cloudy today, but if it was bright and sunny, the sun shining on that building would become part of our experience. But whatever that building is across the, you know, the lane here, you know, we would see just those two or three sides of it. But that's not the impression. Phenomenology is the way that an experience is impressed on the consciousness, okay? Now, if that sounds like it's a load of words. Let me explain exactly what that might mean. And when we see that building, we may only sense those particular sides, but that building, it's an entirety presented to our consciousness. We know there are other sides to it that we just don't see. That's part of the image that it hits our mind, not just the visual thing, right? But we never just, I mean, I don't envision two sides to a building. I'm envisioning the whole thing. If you've been in the building, then whatever experience you've had in the building becomes part of that image that's impressed upon your consciousness, your experience. Um, you could have had a bad experience there. You could have had a good experience. You might know something about the history of the building. Then there's a cultural element. You might have walked by that building, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Who knows what happens to you when you walk by? Maybe you tripped on a curb as you were going up, and that becomes part of the experience that you have in that building. So when you have a phenomenological experience of that building, all of that combined, all those elements and all the ones that we didn't even bother mentioning, all of those things are presented to your consciousness. It's almost like the whole thing. Like even when you look up here and you see this desk, you don't see the back side, but that's still part of the idea that's going to be presented to your consciousness. Now, if that sounds a little silly and such, think of how this would play out in human relationships, right? So when you meet somebody, we're meeting a collection of many different characteristics. You know, there's a lot of, you know, things that are going on just culturally with this person, um, memories, who knows? It could be that the person, you know, something in their complexion or their hair, that even reminds me of something else, and that becomes part of that experience. Now, those things seem pretty subjective. In other words, like, could we both be looking at this same, so, so you ask yourself, are we both looking at the same building? In some ways, no, right? Like, because you could have three different artists. Okay, so we could have that guy pretending it was a rock, and we could have, had, like, everybody around that was doing the, the drawings. It's supposed to be life drawings, so there you go. Um, and they're going to get different impressions of that. So then you might think, well, then, Subjectivity is really just something that comes from you. And usually we would sense something subjective. I mean, by sense, I mean we'd understand something subjective as it's too personal to extrapolate anything important from it, right? So if we're talking about the mind-body consciousness and we're going to talk about phenomenological experiences, we're pretty much going to just be boiled down into here's what I think and what you think. But, you know, these experiences get shared. And we always rely on the experience of the, of the shared experiences. In other words, there's some objectivity into it. So if anybody, like my one daughter likes Nicholas Sparks. Anybody see The Notebook? Okay. Now, I doubt that any of you have had experience being married to somebody who has Alzheimer's, right? But you've probably had enough experiences, even if it's not personally, with people who have Alzheimer's. You've had some experience of, you know, romantic love in your life. 
you can even imagine what it would be like to be so devoted to somebody. I mean, do you see how you can pull all these things together? So that can be a very particular subjective experience that seems to resonate. And the fact that it resonates, there's an objectivity in there, right? Um, one of my favorite scenes from uh, Dostoevsky's um, The Brothers Karamazov is when he's a Russian um, author, and he's talking, um, okay, so first of all, he's, he's orthodox. They're not real keen on Roman Catholicism. And um, so it's set in the Middle, e in Middle Ages, and this is known as the, um, oh, what do they call it? Not the Inquisitor scene. My mind just went blank. Um, I'll think of it in a second. Here's the idea within the story. Uh, Jesus comes back, um, but Jesus comes back as a god. And he comes back healing people and feeding them and this and that. And the, um, the, the cardinal or the archbishop, they have Jesus arrested. And he doesn't know who he is at first, right? It's, this is odd that he can't think of the name of it. It's such a, um, it's such a popular scene. But. So anyway, um, they bring him down to investigate him. And he's going to have him burn at the stake. And he starts on it. He walks in and he says, you know, who are you? And he like stops me. He goes, no, don't tell me. I don't want to know. He says, what are you doing here? He goes, you had to come back as a god, didn't you? You have to feed people. He goes, you have to let them have free will. We had things figured out. You know, in, other words, in other words, he gets to the point, and I wish I could make it more dramatic because it's, it's quite beautiful. He gets to the point where all he wants to do is kill this Jesus figure. But the entire time, Jesus sits there absolutely silent, never says a word. And, and you could picture him as frail, just wearing next to nothing. And at the end, all Jesus does is get up and kisses him on the cheek. And it almost, you know, melts the individual. And he just says, because this is right after he said, don't you know I have the power to kill you? And I will. Tomorrow you're going to burn. You know, this and that. And Christ just gets up, kisses him on the cheek. And then the man says, go. Come to us no more. It's almost like... You know, we, we, we don't have any idea. We have no personal experience of being in some medieval torture chamber. We have no personal experience of being burned at the stake. But we have an experience of how there could be moments of love that melt things. You know, we get that, right? So there's some objectivity in there. Did anybody see Phantom of the Opera? Okay, so you know that one, right? So Eric is the monster, right? You know the scene towards the end where, you know, in order for her not to have her, boy, her, you know, her love killed, she concedes. It says, I'll stay. And if you read it, it's much better if you read, you know, the, the text and just watch the movie. Because at this point, Eric the monster realizes, I have what I want. I have her. I have, but I realize she loves somebody else. But he doesn't really care. He wants her anyway. But once he realizes that she submits to him, and then he goes to hug her and he says, her tears mingled with mine. At this moment, he knows, I can't do this. You know, now, none of us have any experiences like that. But we can almost imagine what it would be like to allow somebody to go because this is better for you, and that's the only thing that love can do. Love can't possess. You know? So my point is, through all of this, is that you know, phenom see, ph that's phenomenology, right? Phenomenology doesn't just look at what's being presented as far as the physical aspects, but it's the entire in toto of whatever that is. And those are the things that are impress us. And this is how we meet other people, right? This is how we greet under other individuals in our life. So what he's trying to get at here is a phenomenological approach here may seem very subjective, but there's enough of these experiences that we share that probably are going to be the same, okay? Now, to, with, that, with that laid out, then he says this. Now, what's it like to be a bat? What would you imagine it's like to be a bat? Come on. I know you think, I mean, you don't have to do a bat, you can do anything. What's it like to be a dog? You know you want to be a dog. An inside dog. A lap dog. One of the big French ones with the Italian haircut, you know? You like one of those. They get fed well. But how, do you, how can you be a bat? I mean, what could you imagine? What would a bat, okay, if you were a bat, what would you be? Come on, help me out. Nocturnal. You'd be nocturnal, okay. You would be blind, right? So how, how do bats see? Or they don't really see, but how do bats know where they're going? What do they do? Echolocate. Echolocate, yes. They fly. 
You could fly. All right. So picture yourself doing those things. Picture yourself. You're only out at night. You got to fly around with your eyes closed, echolocating. By the way, did you ever see the video where a human uh, who was blind that taught himself to echolocate? Yeah, I saw it on a science show, actually. This, he was a young guy. He literally just made like the hunking sounds, you know, I couldn't even do it, like, whatever, he just made like this noise, and it would echo off, and he, and they didn't believe him, so they set things up, and he would, like, walk up to it, and he would, like, make those noises, and he would, he trained himself to be able to maneuver around these things, he couldn't, you know, he wouldn't be able to do this while he's driving or something, of course, but just with walking, he could figure out, as long as it was something large enough, like a little cone might not have done it. But as long as the thing was like a chair or something, he was able to make the sound and listen, right? It's pretty cool, right? But do you see through all of that, we, how do we, okay, we're, like those things that I showed you about uh, the Inquisitor's, you know, tale, um, I think that's what it was, uh, the Phantom of the Opera, those things, they're humans, right? So we have some shared experience with those. And even though our experiences are very subjective, you know, the notebook would not have really touched somebody's heart if you couldn't relate to it. So we're able to relate to that because at least we are close, we are humans, and we are close in those experiences. But a bat isn't the same way. You know, in other words, we can only envision what it's like for us to be bats. So we envision ourselves, like in other words, here we go. I hope none of you dress up like this for Halloween. Um, not unlike Hume, we only have our experiences to work with, Nagel thinks, right? We have no experiences that would resemble those that a bat has. So without any shared experiences, the best that we could possibly do is imagine ourselves being a bat. So we can imagine ourselves flying around. We can imagine doing that at night. We can imagine, you know, doing some sort of like, you know, audible sound perhaps um, for us to um, use as an echolocator. But that's the best that we can do. We can't have that experience, all right? Which, you know, then means, like, you know, what would be, could there be a shared consciousness between us? Not really, right? And because it, the, the same thing, did anybody pick up what he said about Martians? Like, like, if there was a Martian that wanted to know what it was like to be a human, we'd have to assume a lot of things. So if you're like me and you like watching the old Twilight Zones and such, Every so often, there'll be somebody from Venus or Mars that shows up on one of these things. But they're always humanoids, you know I mean? We, because we still think in terms of syllogisms. So we're very rational, we work through things. But can we imagine an organism that, has, that doesn't even think like that? We can't, because we wouldn't even know, like, what, what would we even start? And how would we even communicate that to ourselves? So what ability would a Martian have to understand who we are as consciousness? You know, and you, you think about this, how would we understand the consciousness of even like a chimpanzee or such? We, the best we can do is almost envision that they think along the lines that we do. And then we're going to have to do some evaluation on that. But we don't even know if we're close on anything like that. We don't really know what level of consciousness there is and how far that consciousness goes. Is there something in the universe that draws all this together, right? Or is everything disconnected? And if it's just, but see, this is the mind-body problem. Because if, this is, if, there, if we're going to be reductionists and say that everything is pretty much a sum of how the individual parts work together, then this is not really an issue. It, well, really, all we really have to do is look at it as a system. You know, if we understand the system, then we understand the individual. But we're much different, right? We're not the sum of our genes. Again, even if we're 99%, if we share 90% of the genes with a chimpanzee, then again, that last 1% accounts for all civilization. I mean, that's not a little thing. Um, we could even probably say some, to some degree um, that, yes, we have, you know, chemical actions that go on. I mean, our, whatever happens in our sales is going to be, you know, a chemical reaction, but we're not the sum of that. So you can't just reproduce this somewhere else. Although we know, like, for instance, you know, you know and this is what we're going to talk about a little bit, and I'll leave it for Monday, We'll talk about um, moral responsibility and free will, and that's going to have some play exactly how we understand the human person. 
like I won't I don't know if I'll bring it up, but we all know that certain brain injuries, you know, cause certain um, differences in person's personality. My wife was just talking, uh, um, you know, here's a woman that you know has a degree in psychology and and hasn't you, you really worked per se in that field for the last 26 years, but never stopped using it. People will call the business phone, and then my wife's on the phone for like an hour and a half. And it's like she knows everything that goes on with the family. Well, this one client we have, he, he's the, you know what it means that you have no guile? It's like a person you couldn't even imagine stepping on a hand. You know what I mean? They're like the nicest person in the world. If somebody said, you know, I heard them say a swear word, what, what did they say? H-E double toothpicks? That's about as dirty as it would get, right? Well, this man is like that, but he's been in um, the hospital for the last 19 days, and he's like angry, he's mad, you know, he's being mean. Totally out of, out of, you know, in fact, to the point where they had to do some brain scans to make sure there wasn't some issue going on. So I've read other studies. Sometimes um, there's a, a very specific tumor in the front part of the brain that can cause um, pedophilic, um, uh, exper not experiences, but inclinations. Um, and there was a case, and I'm sure there's more than one, but one I'm thinking of particularly where the nicest guy in the world was a grandfather and started doing something he shouldn't have done with a grandchild. And they realized he had a tumor. And once he removed the tumor, not a problem. About a year and a half later, he started having inclinations again. It made him think, he went back in, the tumor returned. You know? So, you know, we're biological beings. But, so we're connected to this biology. But, you know, in a purely reductionist view, that's the sum of it. But if we're going to ascribe the mental aspect of the young person as something distinct, then, you know, all of a sudden, Descartes' issue of the um, the pineal gland doesn't seem like, you know, what else is there? I mean, he's trying to figure out what's the connection. What makes my arm go up when I think it to go up? Um, how does that all work? Which is interesting because maybe this is where AI, you know, is never going to really be able to achieve something because of the biology behind it, you know? It's not consciousness because there's not some being there. And until there's some biology, I mean, if, if we're our biology, you're going to have to find a way to recreate that. And if you recreate that, you might just be recreating a system, you know. So that's the part of all of this, right? Um, so his point was, is that you can find some objective view within this subjective phenomenological experience. We may not be able to know what a bat is like, but we can do this with other humans, right? And the way he puts it up is that, like in other words, I think he says that a blind person <coughs> might be a little closer to understanding what it's like to be a bat than a non-blind person, but that's not going to quite do it, right? I mean, it gets you closer. So he's saying, you know, the closer that you can get, you know, it, it, the, the less of the human experience that you can in, impose into it, the better it is. But we can't do that with a bat. We have no clue. Um, so it becomes one of these things that we just can't quite overcome, okay? Now, if somebody's going into neuroscience or something, you know, you're going to be all over this type of stuff. Because um, it's like, how do we get to that? And then even then, you know, just because we see, you know, scan, you know, MRI scans and such, what did that tell us? Is that just, we're just seeing, you know, some computer-generated image that came from, you know, some, what do you want to say? Some system that, you know, took magnetic images, but we don't really know what does that tell us. That just tells us what's going on. It doesn't tell us why. It doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us if we see the same thing in two different individuals that the same thing's happening. But yet we can say something, but we have certain brain injuries, and especially in the frontal lobe and such, you know, we can talk about people might have, um, you know, a little, little, you know, little less inhibitions and such, right? We know parts of the brain um, function a certain way. Um, but they're starting to get away. Like, you always heard, like, left side, right side. They're starting to get away from that, thinking, oh, they're not quite sure if that's the sum of it, you know? Like, when I was growing up, that was almost like the Bible. So if you were an artist, you drew from the right side of the brain. I mean, this is how they taught you, right? It's the name of the textbooks we had and such. Now they're thinking, no, because they see people with brain injuries, and somehow that seems to be compensated. So we're not quite sure what else is it. And is every action we do just a, a firing synapse and such? An electrical impulse? You know, it's hard to say. But if you thought that, 
you know, like if you know, like when you dissected a frog in biology class in high school and you did certain things to the leg, you can make it twitch, this and that. Well, if that's all the extent we are, then we have no mind-body problem, all right? But if we're more than that, then we have to figure out how these things pull together. And there's no answer here, right? That's not what he's trying to do. Now this, he says, this gets even a little more convoluted for us. Because we talk about things like anytime you have a, a syllogism, this is that, we always assume we know exactly what the is is, right? Like, and, and my, if it didn't say it in the book, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I read in one of the journal articles in the past about Nagel, but somebody says, well, the theory of relativity is simple, and it equals mc squared. <laughs> really? That's the extent of it. Now you know everything there is to know, right? So just because you say, you know, that which is E, E is, MC squared, doesn't mean that, what is that is? I mean, do you really know the theory behind the whole thing? You know, somebody might say, you know, even with like Christianity, you know, well, God is good. Wonderful. Does that help us at all? What that is is going to be the whole distinction between it. So when we try to, if somebody were to say the mental event, now understand, he's, he does not think reductionism is, is wrong. Okay, like I know so far I've almost been pushing it like there's something, there's a problem here, there's more to it. That's my personal feeling on it, but he's not anti-reductionist. He's just saying these are the issues. You know, in other words, he's being very honest, and he's being, he's being modest, let's put it that way, which is always great for a thinker, because I don't like when people figure they have everything figured out. Um, oftentimes when you see people in philosophy, not, you don't see it as much in philosophy, but sometimes people say like, well, here's what it is. Well, then we're missing something because it can't be that easy. I've always, my personal philosophy and philosophy have been that the more sublime that we're talking about something, the harder it's going to be to articulate it. So I never really find an issue with somebody when they simply can't articulate it. Even think within theology, Thomas Aquinas wrote the Summa Theologia. I mean, what a grand work. I heard the way it was put was that he just sat in his cell for like five years writing this by cell, his room. He just sat in there for five years writing this. And it's an extraordinary achievement. It's almost like you, you should read it, whether you're Christian or not, just because it's one of the great works of Western literature. But when it was all done, he had a mystical experience and said it was all trash. What kind of experience money he had, <laughs> you know? He probably realized it's, it's very systematic. And he probably realized that it doesn't work like this. This is going to, I mean, he, was pro he probably, again, was just being modest. We, we can get a lot from it. But that's not everything. You know, so anytime we think that we have an, a closed system and this sort of explains it, right away my antennas go up and say, ah, there's something goofy here. We don't, there's something we don't know yet why it's wrong. Okay? But he's kind of doing the opposite here. You know? He's saying, okay, like for instance, if we say all matter is energy, we all might, if you're a, a physicalist, you're going to agree with that. Uh, everything. It's, it's, it's some sort of energy. But what's the is? I mean, that's where everything lies. It's like we don't know the theoretical frameworks behind all of this. You know, so he says we don't understand the theory for any of this stuff. But we, it rolls off the tongue quite nice, okay? Let me make sure there isn't something particular that... No. Okay. So I guess what he's trying to say in the end is maybe we're just going to have to leave it that we don't quite know how this works. But he's not willing to just say it's purely subjective, therefore there's nothing that can be learned from one person to the next. This isn't the same as, well, you had a, you know, you had a particular food. I have no idea what that food is. You, you had an experience. Well, I can't, you can't share that experience, right? I mean, especially if you ate a food like that was from another culture, you'd have no way to particularly share it. And, you know, and some foods from one culture to another can get quite disgusting for the other group, right? Like I had friends from, from you know, Ecuador that would eat, um, oh, what was it they would eat? What is it? Guinea pigs. Guinea pigs. You know, I can't imagine that, right? But then, you know, in, in Italian, if you eat, you know, popo, the um, octopus, my wife, it freaks the crap out of her. You look over and see the little tentacles, and I'm like, oh, this is good. I'm, I'm hungry right now thinking about it. Right? When my cousin came to visit me back home, uh, 
like he was he was raised in Texas, and uh, we eat like morcillas, which is like blood sausage. Yeah. It's like thick thick blood. He was grossed out, and yeah. I I love it. Yeah. Yeah, there's something even in Polish. It's called uh, chanina. It's blood soup, duck blood soup. Yeah. You know, they do the same thing. It's you know, so you get these experiences. So what do you? So if you were trying to share an experience with somebody who's never even, you know, now the one thing I don't get is it. it, it it's an Asian dish, but it's that one fish that if you don't just cook it just right or whatever, you can die from it. Yeah, the uh, Yeah, I don't know. What the heck? Really? I mean, you know. Are you on an island? That's the only damn thing that was sitting around. I mean, you know. It's like, it's but like it tastes to. super good. It have to, because it can kill you. In I don't want to eat something that can kill me. In order to sell it, like, the, the chefs have to have, like, a, like a special training and stuff. Like, they have to be certified <laughs> to cook it. Could you imagine? And then you hope he's not tired, you know? It's like, no. He doesn't mess up that one. Yeah. Thing. I'll eat stuff that, you know, I'll try stuff that maybe is disgusting. But I'm not going to try something that, if it isn't prepared right, will literally kill me. You know, not unless I'm on an island. That's like it's either death or just that. You know, it's like playing the lottery. But nonetheless, but you'd have to almost be like analogous. Like if you're trying to share that experience with somebody, right? I mean, if nobody's ever had like a blood soup or something or blood sausage, you, you know, all people are going to have an experience of is, is that blood in a wound, right? So they're going to think it's like literally like just blood. Absolutely. You know, so you have to figure something different. Um, but I, like I said, I know when I eat, like, you know, octopus or something, or even, I love, like, I don't like the big calamari because it's too rubbery. Like, the little tiny ones where it's like the whole little thing. Oh, my God. My wife, she'll run in the other room. She can't take it, you know, that kind of thing. Have you, so, have you eaten it with, like, on its own um, ink? No, like no. Like, no, although there's an Italian deli near me that they make um, spaghetti with uh, the ink. That's, that's yeah. Good. Amazing. Yeah. I've never, I've never gotten it. We just, we, we didn't eat that growing up, but, um, but that's popular. The octopus ink, um, Opa. There you go. Um, so I guess what he's trying to say is, you know, there's always. Yeah, I must, are you hungry now? <laughs> not for ink. Not anymore. Not for ink. Well, see, I never even tried it because it's just literally like a dull purple, and I've never. I, I have. I gotta put it this way. I have eaten it, but I've never made it myself. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a heck of a lot better than that fish that can kill you. You know, <laughs> I don't care how good it tastes. <laughs> Have you had it, Nicole? Yeah. Have you really? Are you scared? Why? <laughs> Are we You're talking about the right food? thing? Is this the stuff that that could kill you if it's not prepared yeah. right? I so mean, you, technically, you just got a lot of trust. Kill you if they're what? not prepared. Right. I guess that's true. I guess that's true. You go to certain restaurants. Just have to go to a place that's reputable. Yeah. Some restaurants won't serve that kind of fish. 